<laughs> Hello. What's going on? Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Dude, I am just in love. The weightlifting shoes, the, I mean, come on, the blackness, the skulls. You nice. are my people. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Those mid-century modern chairs. What the fuck? Ikea. Still yep. in the game. I'm <laughs> stuck in my daughter's room right now. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I just feel like a poser. Nah, you're far from a poser, Kelly. You've been at it too long, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, to be honest, I think a lot of your influence has probably rubbed off in the studio sub subconsciously. <laughs> we just we just took uh, in the back of our our real studio. We just took the siding of our mid century modern house, and I just put this. And it's abyss. It's that dark gray behind mm. us. I'm like, oh, come at me! Like I've got yeah. mid century <laughs> modern. I mean, you know, no, I'm living a dream. Kelly, my name is Owen, and this is Dara. We Pleasure, are. Boys. We've been watching for a long time. We've been. We're. We're actually. You've probably gone through this now, but we're old in the community now. We're. We're both thirty, and it was. Uh, I'd say we were watching you, and we were late teens, you know, and yeah. we were like fresh and coming up, and the cycle continues. Yeah, I remember doing my AC joint when I was in the, my our last year in high school here, and uh, using your videos as as rehab from that AC joint injury. And you're so fucked now. I love it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I still it's can't over it. Stop using my ass right. It's so good. <laughs> um, you no, know, I, I think it's interesting. Um, it's hard for people to appreciate how long we've been working at this. I don't, I don't mean me. We, I mean, like all of us in this community of like saying, hey, what is the best practice? Because sometimes there's some latecomers who jump in and they're like, this is all bullshit. I'm like, hold up. Like, I, I don't know, I like, we're running a lot of tests and we're having a lot of feedback and we see a lot of improvements in wattage of power and position. I'm not sure you can come in and just swoop and poop all that. And the second piece is, you know, we, um, you, we're, we're all about showing your work. I'm like, you need to show me your work. I need to see who you're working with. I need to see the teams you're working with. I need it, you know, because I think what's confusing now is that people can pop up in a gym and film themselves and they don't work with anyone. They don't work with a team. They don't solve the problems of a big group. They don't run a commercial gym. I'm like, it's just bullshit. It's all theoretical bullshit. So now I'm like, hey, I need to see your, I need to see your work. I need to see who you're working with. And that shouldn't have to matter. You should be brilliant in your own garage, but you have to always be showing that, you know? Yeah, I think it's one thing as well, as you get further and further down the line, and it goes from like tens to hundreds to thousands of people, even running like one program. And then suddenly someone comes and asks you a question of like, oh, I'm clearly not going to start with tens or not going to, I don't need that much volume at the start. And you're like, okay, the three and a half thousand people that did it in the last three years <laughs> did need it. Yeah. So I think you need it too. Yeah. Everyone, the universe has created such an opportunity for us to be such unique snowflakes. Like I am <laughs> different. <laughs> As a 50 year old man, you know, I, I am so unique and special. And I, and I think, you know, we always have, I've been talking about this with John Wilburn forever that, you know, there's this idea that, you know, the internet program solves the problem, you know, and I'm like, Hey, look, the internet program doesn't, read your body language when you come in, even if it's AI, even if it's good and looking at your volume, it doesn't watch you move. It doesn't, you know, when, when you're, we've seen Olympic athletes walk around the one foot fence, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're yeah. like, Ooh, they're cooked today because they're walking <laughs> around the fence, not hopping the one foot fence. So, you know, it is, it is an issue that you can, you can be remiss if you didn't understand the person in front of you and really understanding. And when the frying pan's hot, we cook. You know, I mean, like, oh, man, we're going today. Let's get some volume in versus, wow, you're dog shit and you're hitting all your numbers. So, you know, I, really, I think we've made the case for coaches more than ever. But but it is funny when people are like, no, 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 I'm expert. I mean, yeah, someone yeah. just came at me the other day about something and they that they didn't like the way I was describing something. And I was like, hold up, you know, like, who are you? What do you do for a living? Like, you have 23 posts and you're like, you work in construction and this is all I do. And I don't think I'm sure that you're an expert in your family in your garage, but you know, I'm I'm not sure you have all the data. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's and it's hard and social media has, has has been a blessing and a curse that way for sure. Kelly, I remember you going on Rogan years and years ago. I think his studio might have even still been in his house at this point. And uh I remember you afterwards hearing you on a different podcast describing yourself as like a shark with a laser pointer on your head. And Rogan was like, oh, man, I've, 
on meth, on rails. Like, how does it go? <laughs> but I think, like, one of your key defining factors and what set you apart from a very early point was the fact that you can communicate very high level, like academic topics or theoretical topics and break them down so a bonehead like me or Garf can use it in the gym. Is that like, is that something you actively worked on or is that something you built over time? Uh, I think I was victim to that idea that if you just train your ass off, it'll be fine. So early on, I, I was a professional athlete. I paddled on the U.S. canoe and kayak team, and I paddled myself right off the U.S. canoe and kayak team with an, a neck injury. So I had this crazy compression injury on my nerves, like bruised nerve root, hands going numb, couldn't hold the paddle. That was the end. Couldn't turn my head. And when I really got into the bottom of it, I started asking those questions about why no one could really answer. And what I could point back to was the freakish amount of work I'd done. I was paddling 11 to 13 times a week. I was going to the gym. I was riding my bike to the pool to swim and like eating. Yeah, right. Whatever. We maybe, I mean, we were sponsored by metrics. Like we would slug a metrics protein shake once in a while. We were piss poor. We did zero. I think the technical term, and I apologize, everyone cover your ears, a sweet fuck all in terms of looking at position looking at range of motion, looking at recovery as a way of being able to handle those high volumes. And so when I injured myself and really got to the bottom, no one knew why, but they knew it was probably coming. And our, our model at that time was let's break as many eggs as we can and work as hard as we can. And then the next time we'll get a little further. That literally was the conscious model. And so I go to physio school ultimately because of it. And I start asking really impolite questions like, how come all this physio has nothing to do with the way that I was training on the national team or the way my friend, my Olympic friends train or the way that the coaches are talking to their athletes or why is it that an athlete has to be broken and not be able to do their, their sport before they actually even initiate this EMS, you know, this emergency response system. Like, shouldn't these be things be closer? I start leading asking these questions and suddenly we're seeing people like Exos are at least putting a physical therapy office next to the squat rack, like people are getting closer to it. So early on, I, in physio school, I had this whole, this like filter of saying, how can I go back in time and tell me what I need to do? And what turned out was the root shape of everything is position. The root shape is nutrition. The root shape, the root function is output. And those are the languages of strength and conditioning. And I think the problem was, that all of, we got very fanciful and we created this whole sub category language, like the language that we speak in strength and conditioning, forgive me everyone who's not English, is English. But as soon as you're injured or you're in this chiropractic physio world or medical world, you speak Esperanto or classic Greek. And then as soon as you're not injured, you don't ever use that Greek again. And I was like, hey, what's wrong with this classic English language? Like it does pretty good. And so I really worked hard and, I, and it is, I think, it's difficult for a generation of kids who in 2013, when Supple Leopard came out and when we started making videos in 2010, it's the dark ages of internet, of, of programming. We haven't been able to synthesize and integrate as much as we were able now. And I think people come in and I was like, hey, we had to start from scratch. I mean, my early courses, I'd be like, this is your leg. Touch your leg once in a while. And people would be like, I deadlifted on my, de you know, my PR deadlift by, you know, 100 kilos just by touching my leg. So. What we've seen is we've been able to take a lot of slack out of the system, but simultaneously, we've been hyper conscious of trying to say all of this is good. But the two things that I ma can measure and validate is one is your range of motion that every doctor, physical therapist, physician, surgeon. So like the whole supple leopard is just transfer exercises to position. Right. That's the, the thing that matters the most is you being able to maintain your position or the most austere loads, time domains, speed, whatever. And then wattage, output, that's it. Those are the two things I got. And when I really started to frame everything that we were doing in terms of those two contexts, it got a lot easier to say, here's something that I can do for myself. And then I think what you're also hinting at is this real like, important idea about who owns what. And I still am battling this, this patriarchy, this, this industrial complex that does not want to give people information to, to fix it in their homes in their garages and or gives it to their coaches and to be able to work out with them so we're trying to move as much of the things that we think are non-skilled 
out from behind the curtain and give it back to athletes and give it back to coaches, give it back to families. And that is something that I feel very strongly about because as soon as we hold on to that information, are you telling me that anytime my knee hurts after a heavy squat session or after a run, I have to go see a physical therapist like bollocks that I'm never going to work. So do you think the stuff you learned in your education was largely appropriate, but it was the way the message was conveyed. So was there stuff you learned that, did I cover most of the information and most of the practical stuff you needed to use? Or no, was it like- no, you know, so if you, if you pin me down now, I'll say that I was a classically trained physical therapist and a manual therapist. And I'm great. So grateful that I had this, this exposure, especially to this Maitland model, this Australian Maitland approach to manual therapy, because if you are fluent in that model and you open up supple leopard, and I even, I talk about Maitland in the original um, intro to the book, but you, what I tried to do is say, hey, here are all these things about how the joints work and how the body is, works as sort of these components of the system that usually needs a physio to do it to you. What if you could do it to yourself? What if I didn't have to see a physio? What if I could do this every day? And suddenly like Brian Mulligan is this New Zealand physio who's a genius who realized sometimes like the the tailor this 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 tailor fibular joint so the bottom of the ankle where your fibula comes in would just get stuck after an ankle sprain and all he would do is just get it moving again and boom people would have full dorsal flexion and things would turn back on and i remember the first time i saw that i was like what the fuck is that about like you did all this stretching and all these exercises and then this thing wasn't moving and then you got it moving and then boom and so if you understand that what you understand is that i'm trying to take all of that and say, how much of that can you do yourself? You know, so like our hip capsule mode, which is just a classic, is really the hip quadrant done with a mulligan technique. So as soon as I started adding the bands in here, I was like, oh man, I can replicate all of these complex physio techniques. As soon as I got a voodoo floss band on there, I was like, oh, I can do all of these complicated myofascial ART like techniques that do a lot to manage congestion, get tissue sliding, moving, or upregulate input so that someone can go do what? Move again, lift more, reduce session costs. And when we started putting those together in the context of what are the essential shapes that a human should be able to express, then you suddenly had access to a whole movement diagnostic language that was based on what you do. I mean, I've taught on every continent. I even taught in Russia before they invaded Ukraine. Everyone knows what a push-up is. Everyone knows what a bench press is. Like literally, I haven't been in Antarctica, but I'm sure they know what a push-up is there too. So why aren't we using the push-up to describe motions of the shoulder? And suddenly what you see is as soon as we just make those flips, give people some tools, we can be agnostic about the way they want to train. And the only conversation any of us should be having is whose secret school program gets them to the Olympics the fastest. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think people do get that that kind of religion versus science thing where they really buy into a program, they really buy into a system. And we see it in the sport of weightlifting all the time. You'll have somebody who wants to do the Chinese technique, you know, but unfortunately the Chinese technique is for people who have Chinese bone structures and Chinese <laughs> gen- genetic makeups, you know. And kids kids who've been in a Chinese system since they were two years old, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's one of the the people who's going to be on the podcast in the same series as you, Kelly, is one of the physiotherapists from the Chinese national team. And he speaks about the Chinese system not even having a Chinese system because there's 1,200 professionals all working with different coaches. Well, you know, you're really hitting it. And um, what we want to start to do is, one, let me just say that if I didn't speak Olympic lifting, if I wasn't exposed early to Olympic lifting, And my exposure to Olympic lifting predates my exposure to CrossFit. I knew that I needed to learn how to only lift. This was after I'm retired. I'm in my 20s. And I go down to the Sports Palace SF. And I work with Jim Schmitz. And, uh, you know, I work with him. I do a session there. I can't even buy Olympic lifting shoes because the guy who has them in the back of his trunk isn't there. Like, you buy Olympic lifting shoes like a drug deal. And... I go into this basement and he's down there and he coaches me and some other coaches. And he's like, that'll be $55. And I was like, what a deal. I just got coached by an Olympic lifting Olympic coach for $55. He's like for the month. And I was like, what? And it was 55 bucks for the month. And he gave me like videos to watch. He gave me a book and a program. 
And that first time with Schmitz, I, we even coached Schmitz today. I was just thinking of him yesterday. You know, we believe in the seesaw press. I think it's the most important pressing people need to be doing, seesaw press. And he says, put delts on a pencil. I mean, literally Jim Schmitz is in my DNA. And if I don't speak Olympic lifting, I fail to appreciate how speed is the ultimate arbiter and power is the ultimate arbiter, that if you can't hit these shapes and positions, there's a reason why we call it the hang archetype and not the internal rotation of the shoulder when the shoulder's abducted archetype, right? Because that's a position you have to be in. And if, if you can't hit these shapes, then I think that, you know, you can't understand what you're seeing. And Olympic lifting is the harshest mistress. It requires us to have full physiologic, or at least mostly have access to our full physiologic range. So Olympic lifting is the heart of that. When we then come into people's programs, it's interesting that you can have the Chinese method, the Bulgarian method, and you work with Jim Schmitz, you can work with, you know, Dave Spitz, like all my, you know, my influences. And it's weird how all the lifters look so similar on the platform. When I watch, you know, the, the Olympic finals, I'm like, wait, wait, that guy is Russian and that guy's Bulgarian and that guy's Chinese because they all move. So ultimately what we want to start to go through there is say, what is essential and how are these programs alike? And then where the there's divergence, why is there divergence? And how does that suit the athlete or the person in front of me? Super interesting. That's really interesting that you look at them as maybe biomechanical models and you're seeing internal rotation of the hip or the hip or the shoulder or whatever. But when we look at them, you're seeing the Chinese lifters looking massively different because you're looking through a different lens. That's very interesting, actually. I never thought yeah. about that. You're seeing basic or not basic requirements, probably maximal requirements for certain positions. You know, if you're squat jerking and the average lifter tries to, you know, the average 40 year old coming to CrossFit is not going to be able to squat jerk. <laughs> but, you know, if you lose out with 200 they, kilos. They could, they, could, they could do it once. Yeah, yeah. once every. <laughs> so, Kelly, talking about that, that kind of average athlete, the average CrossFit, you've obviously coached tens of thousands of people over mm. probably hundreds of thousands of sessions. What are the go to Kelly Starrett five things that are going to change your session right now in terms of how we warm up and how we mobilize? Well, you know, the key, I think, is people love to ask me this sort of uh, some iteration of this question. And the, the, the question is, sometimes when people don't realize, and I know you're not asking this, but is what's not important? Like, what's the one thing I get to focus on? I'm like, well, what part of your body do you not want to use? Is it not wrists? Is it not shoulders? You don't really give a shit about being able to extend your thoracic spine. Like, what do you care about? So what we're trying to do is say, instead, for most people, how are we going to take the formal language of training where we've got this block and turn it into a diagnostic program or at least into a guide so that every day I'm looking at a component of position because I can't fix the whole machine. I mean, if you grew up as a weightlifting gymnast sprinter, super cool. Like, it's going to be easy. Like, my daughter can overhead squat cold with one arm. And, like, you know, like, she's just been doing this a long, long time, my 15-year-old, right? Her positions are good. And, you know, what I'll say is, wow, it really is useful to have some kind of training age. But for the average person coming in, what we want to say is, and for a coach particularly, what is one aspect of the shape or position we're training in that we want to look at? So we're jerking today. That might mean that we're going to look at your front rack shape or your overhead shape, one of those positions. And we are just going to make sure that we have a more complete version. And then of that shape of one component to one, either start position or one finish position of the movement we're working on. And what we know is that, man, if I improve your overhead, a lot of other things are going to get good. But what that does is that gives me a framework to say, Hey, I, I went overhead today, or that's what we're going to work on. The All Blacks use like Tuesday is ankle day. So they're just going to work on ankle. Well, what are all the things that well, points and flexes? Cool. We're going to work on pointing and flexing the ankle on Tuesdays. So, you know, what's nice about that is if, you know, a heavy snatching day comes in, we can, that's a perfect time to talk about this inter rotation of the shoulder. And the fact that, and the, what, the reason it's important that we are getting more closely associated or tying those things into what we're doing is that your range of motion is going to change day to day based on volume, based on what's going on in your life, based on your recovery, based on all of those things. So what we want to do, we don't need to assess thing every day. The assessment is the warm up. The assessment is the heavy snatch. The assessment is the muscle snatch. Instead, what we'll say is, Hey, I see that you're, you know, 
look, that looked great, but let's go ahead and just fix it today or improve it or check it at the end of session. So suddenly what we do is we create a framework. There's a reason we teach everything from the high hang. <laughs> we teach all the muscle variations first because you need this much range of motion typically for those things, right? And so what we start to say is based on, like I have this thing called the hip spin up and the shoulder spin up. And I want you to do one of those things every day in your house before you get to the gym. I want you to ask yourself, am I ready to receive the coaching knowledge and wisdom from my coaches? Or am I showing up a junk show who isn't fed, who isn't fueled, who's underslept, who doesn't, can't put her arms over her head. I'm like, dude, we're snatching heavy today. Like you can't, like, what do you think was going to happen? And so if we touch those shoulder and shoulder spin up, hip spin up, then at least I've gotten people exposed to some of these end ranges a little bit earlier in the day. Then the specific warmups we're doing as soon as fast as we can, like I hate warming up. I hate it. So I like to get sweaty through games. I throw the Frisbee, I do sprints, whatever, whatever I can do. If I see something on the internet, I start messing around with it. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. I like this, you know, and I use that time to like center. And then I'm under the barbell as fast as I can. And so that means that I'm under load quickly. My warm up is going to be specifically around the shapes that I'm doing. And if I'm not into those general shapes, I don't need to touch all those things. I don't need to sort of noodle on my pistol. I don't need to go after full hip extension. That has to be addressed later on my program. But what I want to do is say, hey, I need 10 to 12 minutes of getting hot, getting sweaty, getting the tissues warm. We used to forget about that, right? It's not just activation. We need to like get tissues liquidified. We need to remind your brain that your arms are going overhead today. And we need to rem remind ourselves that we're going to be quick. And sometimes we need that. Like I jump rope every day, no matter what. I'm always jumping. So suddenly my, my warm up is really contained and really hyper specific around some of the things we're doing, but I've tried to move a little bit more in the day. So there'll be some general pieces and then everything is geared around what I think is gonna be the worst shape that we need to be in or the hardest shape for the group, right? And then I would much rather, you know, do, I mean, if, if you train with me, the number of tempo gnarly movements I make you do as part of our warm up, it's brutal, brutal. And uh, because I'm like, look, you just, you're going to go fast and hustle through this mid shape and you have no connection here. And you're going to wonder why your clean sucks. So why don't we just go slow tempo overhead squat and like 10 and 15 seconds and just show me you can stay connected. And I suddenly as a coach, everything is visible. So I think that answers your question a little bit. I want to get to the training as fast as we can. And if something hurts, then we can jump on it right away in the gym. Now that's part of the language. Hey, how, can we get you desensitized and pain free so we can go back to training? You, uh, you've described there as warm up for every seminar and every camp we do is like five barbell rows, five overhead squats, five oh, presses, yeah. five back squats. Oh, yeah. And they just 15 minutes into an hour class is like yeah. the same thing we've been doing it for years. You know, you could usually see within 30 seconds where the major deficits lie as well. Kelly. So there's this kind of thought process sometimes in a warm up, and I'll see it mostly with powerlifters is that what's the point in rolling around on the floor in a foam roller? You know, I'll just get the back squats and I'll do enough lighter loads to warm up. But do you, do you think that is a, an applicable solution if you have a large degree of hip shift new squat or you have a noticeable amount of lack of dorsiflexion on one side or you have knee pain? Do you think that is a valid way of working through something? Do you think eventually, you know, there's an idea sometimes that it all comes right in the end and rehab exercises don't even do anything. It just kind of regresses back to normal eventually. Well, I think there's two, two, two pieces there. The first is, do I think I need to be doing tons of prehab exercises? No. Do I need to be doing thousands of clamshells as a, as a power lifter or an Olympic lifter? No, I don't. I think what we need to ask is what does this thing for me, all there's sort of two languages. One is there's this language of kind of what I'll call position transfer exercises. So mobilizations. So I'm mobilizing a tissue to come to have a specific change in my position for a specific goal, right? Pain can be part of that. So if I'm starting to, my knee hurts during, and I can't warm up through it, it doesn't normalize. That's a perfect time to say, hey, is there something that we can do to get me out of pain so I can train today, right? Hey, we're having a technique problem. Well, don't we do skill transfer exercises for technique problems, right? And all we're doing is expanding what a technique problem is, big hip shift, your lows and you, that ankle doesn't move well. And why aren't we looking at today's training as a diagnostic tool to try to remedy our positional quality? 
So if someone is just moving great and they're stiff, whatever, let's get under load and try to really understand what we're seeing. I think the, when I say we divide these things between position transfer exercises and skill transfer exercises, skill transfer exercises can be heaving snatch balance, but they also can be corrective exercises, right? And I tend not to rely on lots of corrective, corrective exercises. So I just don't do a lot of them because I have enough tools in my strength and conditioning belt that allow me to reconnect or do single leg stance or, or move slowly or, or regress that overhead position to a strict press where I don't, I just personally don't use a lot of the corrective language because I think that corrective language came out of a time and no shade that work, it works really well. It came out of a time where we weren't all working in full ranges of motion. So if all you're doing is cable crossovers and mid range shitty high squats, and you know, you're not even swinging a kettlebell, then those correctives are really important exposures. They're important vitamins. But in the last 20 years, we've really seen this ex incredible expansion and sophistication of modern strength and conditioning. And in any Olympic lift program or that sort of program as eccentric, and again, you don't have to Olympic lift with barbell to be Olympic lifting, right? Like pushing a sandbag over your head is, is still a version of Olympic lifting. So what I think is I tended to gravitate towards these position transfer skills, some of the mobilizations that allowed me to have access to these shapes that I could see or could that were there or not there. But if someone shows up with pain, what's my plan to deal with that? And I think what we see in our typical model is, well, we'll just ignore it. Or once it's heavy or I can't hear it, I ignore it. And I'm able to train through it instead of saying, hey, let's use this heavy, brutal front squat as a, as a diagnostic tool, not just as a stimulus for adaptation. And suddenly, rolling on a roller in between sets rut helps. And if you go and you're going to talk to these Chinese physios, why do they have people that they've hired to walk on their athletes and do like, they like people are like, eh, foam rolling doesn't work. I'm like, why are the Chinese <laughs> standing on each other, walking up and down with Olympic lifting shoes on? Like there's like, are the Chinese stupid? Because they have a lot of Olympic gold medals and their tissues. So what we see is, hey, wh where and why am I doing that thing? And more importantly, how does that fit into my schema so that that thing doesn't overwhelm my training session so that I stop using my training session for strength, conditioning, skill, those things. And I think that was been my critique. And I'm sure I can, full, full disclosure, I'm sure I contributed massively to the confusion there around you know, if you have an hour to train or 30 minutes to train, very little of that should be mobilizing. That should be done at home in front of the telly. This is for you to get under some load very quickly. I actually wanted to ask you about that is what a lot of people don't understand or might not appreciate is that if you haven't been doing stuff like this for within the last couple of years, if you've been 15 years or more, a lot of people don't appreciate that, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, where if you Google shoulder pain or shoulder range of motion, you'll get 20 different people who are probably very good, you know, but 10 years ago on YouTube, you were probably going to get mobility. What, how do you feel kind of looking back now at how it's come? And to be honest, you know, there was a reason you were on Rogan and there was a reason you were getting so many views on those videos. Do you feel like you got your message across Was there anything you kind of would have done differently or is this, you feel like you did what you needed to do to kind of see mm. where it is now? It's interesting. If we just take the word mobility, for example, I am, I ask people like, where'd you hear that word? And they're like, I don't know. It's always been around. I'm like, no, it wasn't. It was me. <laughs> like, and the reason is I wanted CrossFit wanted me to have something called CrossFit flexibility. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like flexibility, that's like a rubber hose and it's not, it doesn't, you know, stretching didn't capture it. I'm like, what I do is I mobilize tissues. So that was where mobility came from, mobility wad. And we actually defined it as specifically having access to your native range of motion and being able to control that native range of motion. Those, that's really what mobility was. So people are like, they're like, you know, they're carrying their babies on. They're like, I'm, mo I'm doing mobility. I'm like, no, you're just squatting. Like that's not cool, but that's not mobility work to improve your squatting. So, you know, what we've seen is it's great now that we're starting to have a real conversation about position as part of the language of training. And I remain agnostic about how you want to solve that. And if you have a system or a template that's working for you and your community, because what I really believe in is this thing called hyperlocality. 
that your coach knows you better than anyone else knows you. Your training partners know you better than anyone else knows you. So if an expert comes in, and I've seen this, because remember, I work in all the professional sports. I work in the military. I work the FBI and the CIA and these Olympic teams. And, I, and I've seen who's come before me. And I've seen whose work gets used by everyone else. And so I'll see these experts come into, you know, baseball teams and present for two days and no one does their stuff, you know? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure that was very useful. Hang on a second. So the short is that I'm thrilled that people are, it's become ubiquitous and, and expected. And again, the only thing that matters is test and retest. And if you can show me a better way, then I'm interested. And what I, what I, only thing I find weary and tiresome is that the punching down, the shit talking, the you know people have like people who are not working in the trenches, not coaching, don't have decades, don't have any Olympic gold medals, don't have any world championships. I'm like, hey, you know, you can't. You, you, I know that you're taking this position to get views and likes, but it's really shitty. And that, that makes me literally just want to go away and just give up on the whole thing and be like, good luck, everybody. You know? So, um, you know, in the meantime, there's not enough of me. There's not enough of the few people out there, uh, working and it's great that it's become ubiquitous, but again, there's no need to shit talk anyone. Like if you think your system is so good, it will stand up and present itself and will become utilized. And let me say, we've done this before. ART was a thing, right? Active release technique, active release therapy. Did it solve all the problems? Nope. Did chiropractic solve all the problems? Nope. Did physio solve all the problems? Nope. Did every joint chiro, you know I mean? What you see is, hey, we have to take a systems approach and everyone needs a component to this, right? You know, did paleo solve all the problems? Nope. Did keto solve all the problems? Nope. You know, and and suddenly when we expand and we go in, because I'm a, I'm a user on, the, on I, I do a lot of watching of coaching on the internet. It's beautiful to be able to drop in and watch training sessions and truly try to understand what's going on and see what's essential. But what I don't have any time for is, is shit talking. So I always point positive. And if you see someone pointing negative, I'm like, chances are they're really insecure or they don't even have a model. They have just sort of, you know, a couple ideas. That's um. We regularly ask people on the channel here to send in. We do reactions to S and C training for for athletes or for teams. The most common thing we get is people sending us coaches, and it's like a ubiquitous rule. We don't comment on other coaches, and it's all people want is that that venom. They want to see that barking over and back. You know, um. You know, um. You know, you're. I want to double click on this because this is so important. Um. Joe DeFranco is one of my early heroes and he's an incredible person. What he's achieved is amazing. The people he's supported, but he was the first person I can remember who would videotape entire training sessions and you would get to see soup to nuts, what it looked like, all the dirty reps, all the bad reps. And I remember being like, wow, look at this guy showing income, imperfect athletes doing imperfect work getting coached. He was just as transparent as you could be, you know, and when you see a drop in, you see someone like, you know, squatting high to the pins and you start, you don't know anything about what that coach is trying to do. You don't know anything about the history of that athlete. You don't know what the goals are in that session. You're just like watching five seconds of a TV show and then trying to tell me the plot, you know? And I think that that's really, that's bullshit. Really try to understand what's going on. I made this horrible mistake that I'll come out when the first Star Wars started coming out, um, you know, with Daisy Ridley, um, she was running and running in the sand terribly. And her feet were turned out and she just wasn't running beautifully. And and I love Star Wars. And I made this funny joke about, ha ha, like, you know, the next generation of Jedi was here until she cut and tore ACL. And I was like, <laughs> and then the Jedi was gone. It was the end of the Jedi. And I was like, I love Star Wars, click. And like a week later, my wife got this email from this woman she's like wow do i daisy ridley do i know daisy ridley why do i know daisy ridley and daisy ridley had taken the second to find our email and send us an email no of such hurt that she was like i worked really hard and that was me working on technique and hammering and i really didn't appreciate it and there's so much venom about women on the internet and their bodies and i was like 
holy shit, she was absolutely right. I had zero right to comment. Internally, I got my own feelings, but why would I comment on her skills? I don't know if she's a sprinter or not. You know, what we, I apologize. And what we saw over time was that her feet, when she ran, got straighter and straighter, she moved better. But she was like an actor who suddenly was weight lift, lifting weights and sprinting for the first time. Mm -hmm. And what she did say was, I was running from storage troopers and explosions. And I was like, that's true. That's fair. And, that it, and it exposed you. So my point here is, don't comment on what you see, comment on what you like, try to comment on what you're understanding. And suddenly everyone's shit is your shit. And that's what's so cool is that you can get so much better and build so many networks. And this space is really small. So, you know, hang tough in there. Kelly, there, on that side of things is you had knee surgery, I believe, a while back. And oh, yeah. there was a bit of this, I'm not sure if you saw it, but I, um, one of my guilty pleasures is perusing comments on oh, multiple so places. <laughs> I love drama. I, I could be completely involved. I might know who these bodybuilders are, just meme pages, but I love just reading the comments and stuff, especially if I know it's going to be inflammatory. But some of the stuff was Kelly's stuff doesn't work because he had knee surgery. It was the, yeah. the dumbest leap of great? logic. It was, it was incredible. I, I just wanted to ask you to give you an opportunity, maybe not, not even an opportunity to respond, but me and Dara are just interested in the kind of that thought process, what you think of that. You know, um, there's a physio in the UK who um, injured himself deadlifting and his technique is terrible, but people use that opportunity to attack him after he, like he had a, a disc flexion or injury and he, I don't really like this person. But I got on and was like, hey, I'm really sorry that you're experiencing this because this is super gnarly, you know, and no one should be ta commenting on an injury or things. Again, you don't have any, you, you know, so I think what we're seeing on the Internet is a feature, not a bug. That is a feature of just, you know, dilettantes watching his this stuff doesn't work. You know, 10 years ago, I was skiing very fast. I used to race on the FIS. In Europe, I grew up racing. Um, I was maybe racing a stranger on slalom skis. I was going very fast. And I, I I was going like 50 miles an hour and I booted out. I just slid out, which is something I've done a million times. Just just slip. And I caught my inside boot and I just skidded. But the ski caught and I ended up putting my femur through my tibia. And I had Whoa. these two gigantic kissing bone lesions. And uh, so I blew out the meniscus, but Kit had these kissing bone lesions. So these big holes. And I stood up. And I didn't do any damage to any of the tissues, right? My ACL, PCL, MCL, everyone was there. And and I, my wife skied down. She's like, oh, you're covered in snow. And I was like, yep, it just crashed. But I think I sprained my knee. I need to ski down. So I skied down and it started to swell in the car. You know, that was a problem. And after a month, I was like, hey, I, I really can't get ahead of the swelling. And I went and got an MRI. And the doctor was like, well, we should just book your knee surgery now. Like you're going to get your knee replaced. And I was like, hold up. I don't, I don't think you know what I do. And I... I still get a lot of function out of this thing. So right before that, I had just deadlifted like, you know, 575. I had just cleaned 370, right? Like I was like, I'm pretty strong right now. And I think being that strong really helped me to have good bone density, et cetera. So I didn't explode my knee and I put it off for seven years. I got a lot out of it. I deadlifted 600. I power cleaned a ton. And there were things that I stopped feeling good. Like getting in a lunge position was so grindy and gnarly. But I stopped lunging with my right leg back. I was like, no way. This is, it's felt like chalk and glass and just felt awful. So I had my knee replaced because I stopped being able to do what I wanted to do. I couldn't ski with my family longer than about an hour. I had to take a Celebrex to go for a hike. I almost fell with my kayak on a cliff. I was going around a class five rapid and I stepped down and my leg just kind of turned off because I got this weird spot. And so I, I had this knee replacement and um, lo and behold, you know, what I will point to is, A, the x-ray on my other knee looks pretty damn good, which is weird that I have this test. Second is that um, I can do whatever the fuck I want on this knee right now. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like I'm like, come on. I just power clean 225 every 30 seconds for 20 minutes. I just, you know, I'm working up to deadlifting 500. I just, every, you know, on the minute for every 20 minutes, I can backflip. I can sprint. I mean, like, literally you're like, and I'm like, well. I guess the stuff does work because I got my life back. So anyway, any, anytime that happens, you know, you, what we've all learned, as you know, is that it's okay to have people have opinions and you get to develop a really thick skin and it, it's a real chance to destroy your ego. It's a trans, 
chance to destroy your self-importance. And what I learned was, wow, we aren't serving people. I, how many, how many surgeries have you guys helped rehab? A thousand, right? Those people so come many. in after surgeries and you see them. So all, every coach listening, you are part of the rehab process. I mean, they just get discharged and then they're on you. So um, what I got even closer to was, wow, we aren't doing enough on the front end to help manage swelling control, et cetera. So I, I became a much better physio on that side. But anyway, that, that story is it's interesting that I can kneel, I have full flexion, I have terminal knee extension, I can overhead squat, I can do whatever I want on this leg. I can't pistol very well on it because I don't have a PCL or an ACL. Isn't that weird? Yeah. But yeah, let's yeah. be honest, who cares? Nobody yeah. Cares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kelly, I think one of the things that sets you apart, definitely from my opinion, like I spent my entire rugby playing years arguing with physios and going to different physios who tell me my return to play would be a different length of time. And when I started, uh, taking on your content, the big thing you used to always go back to is like, oh, that's all great, but when you have 500 pounds in your back, those squat mechanics are very different. Or, yeah, you feel grand doing an air squat when you're not really tied down to the floor, but you need to develop more tension when the weights get heavier. How important is it, do you think, people have that actual training experience, um, whether that be if they're a physiotherapist or a physical therapist, how important is it to you when you see people working with athletes that they've actually done some semblance of athleticism themselves? I think there's a, if you are working with very acute people and you never have a chance to work with people under load, people who have to be very powerful for their, their jobs, it's easy to develop a certain set of beliefs about the way that you're getting the results you're getting because people are so detrained or so acute that you can get a lot of bang for the buck doing just air squats and slow movements. And it's one of my critiques of rehab return to play is that we don't actually see a lot of, of speed in the work. We don't see a lot of speed load in the work coming back. And, and you are seeing like people, the guy, the men and women at Sportsmith, if you're not following Sportsmith, you should follow them. They, they're some of their return to rehab stuff. There are excellent, excellent coaches out there promoting this. David Gray Rehab, great. Um, so what I'll say is um, it's useful to put people under load early and often, whatever that load is, because ultimately what I'm trying to do as a coach or a physio, it doesn't matter, is say, here are the best shapes that give you the most options, most movement choice that allow you to express the most power. Like you can definitely power clean with your back like a rainbow. You're just not gonna be very powerful, right? And there's a reason why we try to limit or that spinal flexion gets limited in, in dynamic movements because it's just not efficient to try to limit the amount of flexion in the spine. You can grind slow. And that's why ultimately I'm like, speed is the thing that matters the most, not even load, it's speed. And ultimately some speed and some load together turn out to be really, really excellent diagnostic. And so I think it's easy to not understand how the principles continue to scale. And what I'm always looking at is how does this, it, this thing I'm teaching this child or this thing I'm teaching someone who's in surgery, how am I gonna continue to press the, progress that on the way up to the Olympics? And so for a lot of people, it feels like that Olympic side or that sports side or that pro side feels like dark arts because you don't have any language there and you don't know what you're doing progresses. And so again, one of my critiques, I think of, of corrective exercises, I'm like, well, how do I know I'm getting better at this? Right. My pain goes away. Well, I can make your pain go away with bourbon very quickly. So, you know, if I can't continue to load it, add complexity to it, measure, because we're, everyone's like, it's gotta be measurable. It's gotta be right. Like we have to, and I'm like, well, how are you measuring the effectiveness of your clamshells? You know, how are you measuring the, the effectiveness of that single leg? Like what you're, you're seeing is, hey, I'm doing these things. I'm moving the tissues. I don't have any pain. That's cool. But it's, again, hard to show me progression and hard to show me, you know, succession in that. So um, in so much of sort of answer your question, I think it's useful to have a foot on that side if you're going to work in this population so that you can continue to be additive to the process and that eventually you're just handing that athlete back over to their strength conditioning, you know, world. I work, I'm a volunteer physical therapist at Cal Berkeley. Um, I, you know, put, so for example, I was just at the, I was just at the FBI last week and they have one physio who comes in one day a week and sees the, the operators. The problem is 
What do they do for the other, you know, six days of the week? So who's responsible? This is why the strength and conditioning coach is the most important person in the healing didactic sort of process. That person, the strength and conditioning coach is at the center of the, of my universe. They communicate to the physician, they communicate to the physio, they communicate to the nutritionist, they communicate to the, you know, the massage therapist, but this is the only person who really understands what's going on and really has a snapshot of what the development looks like, what the problems look like, what the environment looks like, what the home life looks like. It's a strength coach. So what we want to do is say, how can we unload all this unskilled work here make this person continue to be better and better so that when we need to pull in an expert, we pull in an expert. And I think the physio is not the expert. The strength coach is the expert. The physio is the person who gets, helps to manage a problem that is either out of my skill set or is too tough, or I don't have the time to do it because I'm a strength coach. Kelly, on this subject, eventually at some stage, say as SNC coaches, you've got to send one of your athletes to a relevant therapist, you know, and very often, people ask, how do you find a good therapist? And unfortunately, when it comes to, if you don't have 10 plus years experience of training and seeing really terrible experiences and you build up your kind of bullshit meter, this might be unanswerable, but do you have a checklist for someone when they have to go see someone? Do you have any way of a couple of templates or a couple of things you could look for when you're trying to find the therapist, whatever they are, chiro, physio, yeah. Yeah. And the therapist is the right word because it could be napropath, osteo, chirophys. We don't, turns out my friends, I can't tell what school they came from because we all practice the same way. Right. I mean, really it's like, we think the same way. We understand pain science the same way. We understand strength and conditioning the same way. It's just the body only does a certain number of things. So we might have a different set of tools, but ultimately you can't tell. Um, my, one of my, my best friends and superstar, a member of our staff is a Cairo and he's just a genius, but he's also a brilliant strength and conditioning coach. Um, the first thing I say, and this is so important, if we could clip this out and, and help serve the world, I think this would be great because it really is a gigantic problem. So I was working with a high level surfer, a couple of time world champion surfer. And when I, this person is traveling over the world this last year and what I would do is call the local Olympic lifting club or the local CrossFit gym. And I'd say, who's your physio? Who works out there? Who do you go see? And then I would connect them. So one is that that work has been done for me oh, yes. by all of the coaching staff. Because number one, if that physio or therapist isn't in the gym with you training there, I'm a little bit suspicious. Number two, um, if that person tends not to be also be a member of the strength conditioning staff, for me, I'm a little bit suspicious. So it doesn't mean they're not geniuses and it doesn't mean they're, I won't send them, but I want a person who is alongside, understands sort of the demands. And that means that they typically are physio coaches and they typically have some kind of relationship or they've been so vetted because the athletes come back fitter, stronger, right? And th here's number two, anything that this person is giving them the athlete predominantly can do themselves and they do it in my gym in front of me. So we're going to train, we're going to protect that injury or that site. And then they're going to do all of that stuff with the team. The second a physio or, or some kind of therapist pulls that person away from their community and starts to isolate them. That person starts to become detrained. That person starts to become weaker. That person starts to become sort of isolated and depressed. That, those are gigantic red flags for me. So again, I think it can all happen concurrently. If someone, we always try to say to people, I'm like, when I, when I just worked with someone, do you understand what I think the problem is? Yes or no? Do you know what you're going to do about it? Not me, what you're going to do about it. And do you know what the next step is? And if I can't get a hold of the issue in three visits, I fire you and kick you to someone else. And I don't use three visits. So if someone's gone to someone more than three visits and if they're managing like a surgery, acute surgery, it's just a problem and they're not gone in three visits, red flag. If someone's not in the gym, red flag. If someone doesn't know what to do on their own, red flag. So if someone starts to say things like, don't lift anymore, don't put 200 pounds over your, like they start to make these arbitrary goals, I'm like, red flag, gone. And so, but mo mainly the most important thing is who cuts your hair? Do you cut your hair? Do you cut your hair? Do you just pick up the phone and dial a random and be like, cut my hair random? No, you're like, who cuts your hair? I want to go to that person. Like you, there's a whole bunch of weird stuff that we do as humans where we get someone else's help or someone else's suggestion. 
but physio like we're like i don't know my, my insurance paid for it i'm like that's super weird that is super weird you're just gonna Some go points. see a blind stranger yeah. and not and not have them know anything about you crazy that's crazy especially something so important i yeah. literally the only therapist i've seen i was a two-hour round trip because i've seen so many other people that it's just a waste of time and money it's easier to make the time in the evening even with a 14 month old baby i'll still make it happen if i need to go for that two-hour round trip because it's just not worth it otherwise it's a waste of time and it's so disheartening if we yes yes and yes and that person loads you up with a whole bunch of work to do yeah and i almost feel like what we what we should do and this is no slight on anyone some people are not as obsessed as the three of us it's okay this is all i think about all day long that's all i think about and it's all i think about with my kids my wife is my trading partner like this is this is, uh, uh, this is it but what I'll say is, um, if you want good outcomes, choose good patients. If you want to go to the world championships and win a world championship, you should choose world champions to work with. Like, I know. I mean, you, you can spot talent. You can develop someone. But what I'm saying is, um, is that as a physio, I want to work with people who are like, show me what to do, and I've got this. And we almost need to divide the field into, hey, my insurance is covering for this. I want to do the minimum dose. Great. Though we need those people working in the hospital, working for just, hey, I'm not really, really motivated, but my elbow hurts and it's getting in the way of my job. Versus I need to get back to my thing and I'll do whatever it is. Oh, I'm drinking goat blood and I'm getting up at two in the morning and I'm doing these weird extras. I'm in, just show me. And the most important thing, and and this is I, I just we can't circle this around. If you're seeing someone or nutrition or you're getting coached, we want to ask, is it making you better towards winning at your sport? Because I think that like I am getting stronger. Cool. Did that make you better at your sport? No. Okay. You, you working on some soft tissue that make you better at your sport. Oh, I can't, I can't tell. So we really want everyone to come up with clear, measurable details. I saw this, I saw change in my range or my, it was easier to hit that range, and that ultimately reflected in my wattage going up. Pain going down, wattage going up, poundage going up. I was able to handle higher volumes. I had less stiffness. You can create whatever those metrics, those outcomes are, but we need to be more outcome-driven. And we are outcome-driven. I mean, if you go into any Olympic lifting session, we make a hypothesis. Here's the work I want you to get done today. Here are the numbers I want you to hit. And then we test that hypothesis. That's what we do. And ultimately, then we come back and we say, what do we need to do to make those numbers bigger? And how do we rework that hypothesis for the next day? And so we want to apply that same level of thinking to anyone. And a physio should be able to tell you, I think that typically this problem gets better in two to three weeks or four to six weeks. I think I need to see you two to four times max. We'll see. And here's what you're going to do about it. We can answer all of those questions. And if you can't, you should you should think red flag because that that may be a great physio but not a great physio for you. Yeah. Kelly, oh, all right, go for it. Go no, one of the biggest things I say when people have surgery is whatever that physio in the hospital tells you to do, even if they're a terrible physio, the chances are they've seen that ACL reconstruction fifty times this week or more. Just do what they say because there's a massive chance they've probably honed it down to a a usable format that might work better. Yeah, and, and use that as a starting base, right? Is that that doesn't mean that's all you're going to do. That's you're going to do that on top of whatever else. One of the things that I want every coach to hear who's listening is don't get into pissing matches with the medical staff. Like that's just you're just going to cut everyone's face off, and it's not very fun. So you know we want to be tightly coupled, and the best thing you can do is communicate every single day. Like be annoying, send texts, send emails, call them up on the phone, tell them what's doing, tell them how you're working, tell them what's their stuff's working. They love that feedback. And, you know, to the extent that, you know, if you disagree, that's cool. You can do all of their stuff and all of my stuff too. Because three sets of 10 air squats, how long is that going to take? Two sets of 20, this bullshit, how long is that going to take? Great, we're going to do it. So what I'm saying is you don't have to, you know, say to them, hey, I don't think that's that's incomplete. Do that stuff and do it in the gym while you're training because – I've got the sling on and the safety squat bar and we're squatting today and I've got you on, we're doing brutal couplets on the assault bike and uh, you're going to die doing your rehab. And then when you go back in and they're like, wow, your results are so good. And I'm like, I know it's so weird. 
<laughs> all I did was continue to train and sleep and eat and do all the things that athletes do. And I think that's what's so important is that we know what we know because we are rooted in an athletic tr tradition. I think that's really important. You know, and whether it's sleep or community or you know, down regulation or supplementation or nutrition or strength conditioning. It's all based on, does this get my athlete to win a world championship or not? Kelly, one of the key sound bites, I remember you from, I put it around 2013 somewhere. I think you were oh, talking about Arsenal football club and you talked about the only commitment you needed from them is they'd squat heavy at least once a week. Can you talk about <laughs> can you talk about the importance of squatting for a sport like soccer or for any field sport? Yeah, you know what what we're really looking at, and if we're totally honest, strength and conditioning is really simple, inelegant, non-complex movement. So if you're struggling to handle these very simple positions, because go ahead and play some high level footy. And let me know, go up, jump into a rugby scrum and just tell me like your perfect shapes and you're organized, dude, it's crazy and chaotic. And I need to be able to combine all of those things all at once. But what strength conditioning does is give me classical ballet and tissue tolerance and strength and key positions that allows me then to go do the sport. And I think it is Olympic lifting and powerlifting confused us because those are sports that are recursive. I Olympic lift, so I get good at Olympic lifting, so I can go to the Olympic lifting contest and come back and Olympic lift, right? Versus I choose to use these tools. Like I have a daughter who's 15, who is an unbelievable water polo goalie. Just last week, she was, here's a proud brag. She was the woman Bay, Ath Bay Area athlete of the week in high school, nice. right? So she's 15. She's this monster. She has this monster arm. She's 5'10", six foot wingspan. Fuck. She's like super goalie. And people are like, how can she throw the ball so hard? I'm like, she muscle snatches and we <laughs> overhead squat like it's her job. And we've been doing that since she was two years old. And what we're seeing there is she's having to be in a whole bunch of very complex positions and perform. And what I'm doing is assuring that her nervous system is coordinated to do the simpler versions of those things in the, in the, in the weight room. And it's a place where we can slow down and really understand how the athlete is moving and how they're problem solving in ways that it's really difficult to see on the pitch unless you're a genius. Unless you've watched 100,000 soccer players run and you've seen, hey, that person cuts in this certain way and it's different than they've done. It's impossible to do that because we're playing a sport. It's not impossible to say, hey, I see your little high or I see that foot, left foot is turned out or you're dumping this or you are doing something different on your left side than your right side. So suddenly, What's nice about that is that if we can get those tissues under some load, then we really do start to build some resilience and some tolerance in the system. But it really is easy for us to pick out all the components that we're going to then use later on to make these more complex things. Jerry Flannery, um, you know, came over from this little uh, this little other team. I forget what they were called, Munster. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, we might have heard of it before. And, yeah. yeah, and you know. Um, he came in and was doing incredible strength and conditioning work at Arsenal. So Arsenal was smart enough to hire this rugby superstar strength coach who had been front squatting his whole life, started to get those academy kids under load early on. And now Jerry's over at the Harlequins just destroying. I mean, you know, so what, what's interesting is, again, I think what we want to understand, help people understand is, I'm looking at a fundamental set of positions that everyone should be able to achieve. You might not need them in a sport, but it sure is nice to have your hip be able to flex all the way, right? That's sort of important. And strength and conditioning is a way of me challenging your ability to be able to achieve those shapes. And what I'll tell you right now is it's not just load, it's load and cardiorespiratory demand and speed and volume and metabolic demand and competition demand. And if you can do all those things, then the chances are you're going to be a lot more durable and a lot more stable and you're going to have a lot more movement choices. Um, I'll point everyone at Franz Bosch. If you haven't met Franz Bosch or into his work, uh, Bosch Movement Systems, a lot of really elegant thinking about, hey, this is as much about coordination in a really controlled environment and developing more coordinated movement as it is just getting stronger. And simultaneously, the other side of that is we are starting to see, I was just talking to Zach Evanesh, 
we are starting to see more and more injuries in youth athletes because they're not strong. They're very sophisticated, doing a lot of jump training, movement training, proprioceptive like training, but they're not strong. They can't front squat, they can't bench, they can't deadlift. And there's a reason why Bart Starr was like power clean, back squat, bench, overhead press, like some of these foundational movements. And if we stripped them down to Bulgarian style, I'm like, well, front squat, snatch, clean and jerk. I'm like, okay. like, if you do those things, I'm probably going to get enough stimulus to make you a world champion the other way. Zach Evanish, Joe DeFranco's blog. Wow, what a fucking, what a throwback. Yeah, you're showing out some names there that I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, and uh, I just uh, just as a, to reiterate, I am only a network, a cog in a network of coaches who obsessively talk to each other. And uh, just like we are, we there are really extraordinary coaches in the world. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be, you know, my friend Evie Casagrande is the women's strength conditioning coach for Ireland football. You know, like I ask her a thousand questions about coaching women footballers like I don't know how to do that I've never coached a woman footballer in a national team but she does and every warm-up she puts up I watch obsessively why is she making that choice you know and then I ask her Kelly I'm I really have to ask about the whole and you're probably sick of talking about this and hearing it is the flexion and extension under load you know so maybe rather than what you think about currently but you can touch on that if you feel it's pertinent where do you think it's going to go because I feel like the best answer right now is the research is unclear and you probably shouldn't do a lot of it until proven otherwise. So, you know, the rounding your back and your deadlift, a little bit of lower back flexion and squatting, butt wink. Do you, if you must have mulled over that a lot over the last while. Yeah. You know, I think the mistake everyone made was saying flexion under load causes always is going to cause injury. I don't know. If, are you, have you guys ever seen someone round their back on a pole? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. 10,000 10, 10, times, 40,000 yeah. times, probably a hundred times like, a day. <laughs> how, how many times did the disc squirt out and shoot you in the face? Not yet. So it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen very often. Actually, believe it or not, where I see the vast majority of problems are in being overextension that I see an extension sensitive athlete who can't tolerate those high extension loads on the bones. I would say we're actually much more flexion tolerant than we are extension tolerant. I think our tolerances for smashing and then what we start to see is spondy, et cetera. So what I'll say is I think the best expression of the movement keeps us in a more mid range position. We have better access to the musculature. We can recruit more sort of muscular systems. We can create higher intra-abdominal pressures. We can take bigger breaths. If you're talking about rotating your neck, let's just say something stupid, like turn your head, we'll go ahead and round, turn your head. Now sit up in a position. I didn't tell you how to sit up. I just said, get into a position where you take a big breath. Now turn your head and your head turns. So what we see is that a lot of the conversations of this are what we what should be described as, uh, E.O. Wilson describes this as artifacts of scholarship. They're really important discussions, but they belong in these little microcosms of like side debates, right? Do I need to do heavy, heavy rounded deadlifts? Well. What, what I think what I'm always asking is, what am I practicing? And if I'm practicing rounding my back in the scrum, I'm going to round my back or under this load, I'm around my back. And simultaneously, it's impossible not to ride a bike without some rounded flexion. So we want to make sure that we don't just say we have to live in this rigid architecture that no one has said that we all read the spinal engine. We all understand that we train all these positions. The real question is, you know, I made a video a long time ago. It was like, you know, how, do we really, are we really a strength engine coach? Are we really afraid of spinal flexion? And I just put up like 30 movements, like toes to bar and forward somersaults and like a thousand stupid things where you're back rounds. And I was like, oh, it turns out we're not really afraid. In fact, we train those things all the time. The real question is under speed load, does that transfer to the most movement options, the most movement choice, the most ready, readily available access to my physiology? And what you see is, wow, we don't see a lot of rounding the backs and Olympic lifts at the Olympics. Why is that? Well, because it turns out it's a poor transfer of energy to the system, right? And suddenly we start to get into why I have every child I've ever worked with swing a kettlebell because you can't swing a kettlebell like a dog taking a poop. Can't do it very long, right? But as soon as your back is straighter, you can get, you know, you have better function of the hip, you, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that speed for me is a lot of these conversations about spinal loading are all in movements that are done slow, that are done under tempo. 
And if we're talking about, if you've ever gone to a yoga class, don't, don't, don't hate me, you guys, but there's this thing called yoga. No. And <laughs> what you'll be shocked about is how many times you round and unround your back in yoga. It's almost like someone is saying, Hey, this is important. Let's maintain this shape. Let's not have you be a rigid automaton because Larry wheels is a very impressive human being, but he's not a very impressive sprinter. And what we see is that there is a trade-off towards being brutally strong and then still being highly athletic. And I don't think we have to lose our athleticism. And if we're getting so strong that we're losing our athleticism, please see Bondarchuk, who is like the greatest throws coach of all time, who was like, hey, let's stop adding one kilo to your bench press and let's go throw more. And underneath that, I think, is this really interesting idea that we have fetishized and, and organized our time in the gym sufficiently and sufficiently robustly that we have started to weed out how much time we're actually playing sports. And I think that's the problem is that I can probably get all of the spinal loading to pick the soccer ball up and do what I need to do. But under these formal conditions in ballet, the ballet dancers I know can all, I work in formal ballet, they all can do, you know, African dance, but then they also can do ballet. And what I'm really looking for is that my athletes have strategies where they can choose to be stiff and they can choose to be dynamic. But I think my biggest problem is if you're only choosing to be rainbowed over and that's your only strategy, what I'm seeing is incomplete learning and incomplete exposure. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Kelly, one of the big things, you're one of the kind of OGs of CrossFit. You were- And from... I gotta say, shout out Dr. Andrew Locke. I love Andrew Locke. Shout, oh, shout out Andrew Locke. Austra is the Australian guy? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen his stuff. Yeah, it's good. Uh, but Kelly, so you're there, the, the CrossFit San Francisco days of training in the car park with the the tarp over by the shipping container crossfit's obviously gone through a massive change in the last number of years and i know you're not strictly in the the gym owner business anymore but can you talk a small bit to that kind of change we've seen in crossfit and how you might have perceived that i think you know um early on again this is one of the things that i think is is lost in this conversation when i opened the gym with my wife in 2005 Fuck. um I, I, start, I know, right? <laughs> That's a long time ago. Um, you couldn't buy a kettlebell in San Francisco. No way. Hard stop. So what I'll ask you is how much overhead squatting were you doing in 2005? Well, you guys were Olympic lifting in high school. You were there, right? But if you weren't in an Olympic lifting club, you didn't put a barbell over your head. You didn't go up and down. You didn't perform these basic things. You were doing a lot of bodybuilding and gym bro stuff on machines. And what we saw was no one was really strong. You know, someone would like, there's an old video out there of like, the, like chasing 300 overhead. That was like a video we made. We're like, which one of us is going to jerk 300 to first? And like, seriously, like that was, that's a thing, you know? And um, like, okay. And it was like, big deal. Like I jerked 300. Like, oh, wow. Good job. And so when we started this thing, no one was doing these things. And there was a lot of slack to take out of the system. And so if you put CrossFit on this through the lens of it's the early 2000s, no one is doing pull-ups, no one is front squatting, no one is deadlifting, no one is back squatting, no one is running, no one is doing ring work. There was, we were really weak, we weren't really fit, and we weren't really strong or skilled. Fast forward now, and the world has really changed. We're seeing that, you know, hit, for lack of a better phrase, high intensity exercise is everywhere. You know, people are comfortable with F45 and they're comfortable performing work under high metabolic demand. We can now say, okay, everyone can swing a kettlebell. You can buy a kettlebell at Walmart. You can buy Olympic bumper plates at Walmart. I mean, literally like it's, it's crazy where we live in this world. So now let's ask the different set of questions. Like, okay, we're, we're starting to be exposed to these formal languages. What and how can I take CrossFit and have it serve the needs of the person I'm with. And I really do appreciate that CrossFit always put an emphasis on conditioning. I think there are a lot of strength and conditioning coaches who are really light on conditioning and heavy on strength, Yeah. right? I'm like, hey, running the stairs once a week with your athletes isn't conditioning, that's running the stairs. So are you looking at energy systems? How are you evaluating? So CrossFit, I really do think that they were saying, you know, Greg really believed that people kind of fell apart until you had athletes who were engaged in actual sports. So if you're actually training rugby players, how much conditioning do we need in the gym? Just a little bit. 
and just enough to use it to challenge the position of my athletes with a different stimulus, right? So, you know, if, if front, you know, front squatting 100 kilos is easy, I'm going to have you come over to this bike and we're going to do 400 watts on the bike for a minute. And then we're going to go front squat 100 kilos. And suddenly you're going to have to breathe hard and stabilize and hate in your face. Now that's a real different thing. So I think if you go back in time, there's some things I just don't do anymore because I'm a 50 year old guy. And, you know, it's OK. I, I believe in the sanctity of strict pull ups. I love, love strict pull ups. Um, you know, do I do glued ham raises and a bunch of ring work? No, I don't. You know, and what I would say is, okay, now we're at a place where we're seeing the sport of CrossFit has unique demands, but so does rugby, so does soccer, right? So does any high level sport. And I don't need to do those things to go play, pick up rugby or pick up soccer with my fans, friends and family. So again, as a template to say, are you competent with a barbell, a dumbbell, a kettlebell during the basic lifts? Can you do that with some conditioning? Boy, I think you can continue to CrossFit for your whole life and actually feel better. And, um, you know, I do very few lifts that aren't under a clock on under some, you know, time domain. So it's not just peak lifting because at some point I don't want to get bigger. I'm strong enough to go skiing, but I really like to Olympic lift. Right. So how do I wrap my head around that? And I think what you're seeing in the best gyms in the country who are the, I think the best expressions of CrossFit, you're starting to see people like Marcus Philly do great bodybuilding and aesthetics. You see people say, Hey, I want to get stronger. You see John Wellborn saying, Hey, here's how we can take this tenets and actually not blow you out with a three hour gym session. And you can still play a sport. And now what we have is really simplified program. Does Getting- that answer your question? 100%. You must love the rise of the hybrid athletes, you know, the really jacked people doing triathlons, people doing five, well, there's two people who've done it, like a five minute mile and a 500 pound squad in the same session or the same day. Are you kind of enamored by that? Have you followed much of those people? Have they come across them? But, well, I'll tell you, I think we're enamored of those people because we're not allowing many mutants. But I, mm-hmm. if you're actually in sport, I'm surrounded by mutants who can just do mutant things all the time. And so it is cool to see how far we can progress these athletes. But if you, one of my besties and just one of the best coaches in the whole world is a guy named Yami Tikkanen. He's a Finnish guy and his company is called The Training Plan. He's, he's coached Annie Torres' daughter across the champion for a long time. And he is one of the most sophisticated, nuanced, rationed coaches I've ever met and is an expert in aerobic training, anaerobic training, strength training. And what I like about what CrossFit did for a whole generation of coaches is really forced us to become competent in all these other domains that, Hey, I had to be really good at swimming and I had a program swimming and I had to be good at running where I still think the, the problem with CrossFit is, is that as a standalone GPP program, GPP is not sports preparation training. GPP is get a little stronger, get a little fitter. It solves all the problems right? Sports preparation starts to look at foot position, shoulder position. Do we have access, right? I'm gearing towards actually playing a sport and then sports specific training during the season is the only goal I have is for you to be better at your sport and not get injured, right? That's the goal. And so I think the GPP, you know, people like, and and I think it's a, a fair criticism to be like, people like, or they're addicted to their high intensity exercise. That's fine. It's what they want to do. You want to do Zumba and powerlifting? Dude, that's your jam. You do it. But What I think is it's easy to get lost in CrossFit and do smash yourself like the elites are doing, Matt Frazier, the best athletes in the world. You don't have any energy to actually go do another sport, you know, and what we see is someone like Tia Claire Toomey, who has been, you know, qualified in Olympic bobsled, you know, went to the Olympics and Olympic lifting during those times, she has to not CrossFit as much, right? She's, she's doing enough conditioning, but what I think is, you can't be a highest level expression CrossFitter and have a sport life. You can CrossFit and do something else a little bit if, it, if the CrossFit is tamed. But that's what good strength conditioning is. It's just a different model. Do you kind of lament a little bit in the way CrossFit has gone? There's people throwing around recently that CrossFit is dead, which is obviously a, an over, you know, hyperbole, hyperbole, whatever. But, you know, you were one of the people on the ground floor 2005 you were very involved with a lot of crossfit are you kind of mm, maybe sorry with how it's gone or do you think it's just a natural play out because like you said you can buy kettlebells and when i started weightlifting in 2009 
there was two gyms in all of Munster with bumper plates and one of them was a CrossFit and the other one was the university. And do you, do you have any feelings towards it or you feel like it was just a natural progression? CrossFit was always kind of going to taper off a little well, I bit. Think, no, I think um, what's cool is we've seen the natural evolution and sophistication where we see some of the best coaches in the world are in CrossFit gyms. Really some of the most sophisticated programming go to Rich Froning's house, like really like deep thinkers. And then simultaneously, we've seen CrossFit become what I'll call fitnessing. And if you're, I'm, I, having abs and taking your shirt off on Instagram does not make you an athlete. And it doesn't make you a good, you know, competitor. Like you look great naked, but that has sweet fuck all to do with you being an athlete. So again, I think some of the conversation around aesthetics has has colored this and that fitnessing hey I, like it, fitnessing is there's nothing wrong with it like i can go do p90x or i can jump into this orange theory class. it's fitnessing i go and it's like entertainment go to a spin class it's super fun I, I i'll go to a spin class and have a great time it's not going to develop my athleticism it's not going to make it doesn't not it's non-specific so i think what you can almost do is split this up and start to say hey there are people getting really good coaching for sport inside CrossFit gyms using a CrossFit ish template. And then you have CrossFit as fitness experience, community driven experience for, and that's fantastic. I would say that CrossFit is as sophisticated as ever before. You know, do I believe in high rep deadlifts? I don't. If you work with me, you get to pull singles. We pull lots and lots and lots and lots of singles and your time is going to be a little slower, but if you want to, go fast. I'm going to hand you a hundred pound kettlebell or a 200 pound kettlebell. And we'll swing that multiple times. So again, what I like is that no one said that I couldn't tweak my demands. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I still use the CrossFit methodology for myself. My family likes to train this way. Do I do these long, brutal things? No, I'm trying to train specific shapes and positions that allow me to go express those things through sport. Kelly, I have to ask this one. But, and it might be one of those questions you're like, people ask me this and I can't give an answer, but the bane of field sports athletes' lives, and you can probably guess where I'm going with this, is hamstring injuries. And yeah. is there anything... I'm so glad you brought this up. Do you have some... Cause, I ha- yeah. yeah, I think you just have to turn your bed and your kitchen and everything else into a Nordic hamstring. <laughs> no. Um, honestly, here's what my thinking is. I think our quadriceps and anterior chain get so developed and stiff that it inhibits our glutes. And if you get, if I put you into a big lunge, if I put you into the couch stretch and you can't squeeze your butt with normal physiologic range, so you don't have access to physiological range, what we have seen is that your glute becomes highly inhibited when the quad is stiff and the anterior hip is stiff. That means that your hamstring is now extending your hip and flexing your leg. And every athlete who's ever tweaked a hamstring is deficient in hip extension. Let me say it again, not good in hip extension. Can't, is extending their hip when they stand up from the squat. That is not the same thing as hip extension and has a stiff anterior chain. And I don't think it's a strength issue. If I went into your programming, I would ask you, where are your eccentric motions in your lifting? And what we see is that there's not of a lot of sort of hamstring dominant eccentric loading, unless you swing a kettlebell, unless you do lots of, you know, uh, Olympic lifting, there's, there's some just movements in there that we see lots of eccentric loading on the hamstrings and most training I see doesn't do enough eccentric loading on the hamstrings. That's why I think when you add a Nordic hamstring curl in there, it works because they're actually getting really pure, pure uncut hamstring care, you know, you know, extension, uh, loading, but I think that if we got more, spent more time in a split position, split stance, lunge shake, we did more loading in those positions, like the Franz uh, Bosch, uh, I call it the press. You basically, front foot is up on the box. You're in a tandem stance and it just loads the shit out of your hip. And, you know, and what you'll see is, man, you're really not very good with that hip and extension. Um, Wes Kitts was having all kinds of weird knee pain uh, going into a, a really big cycle is you work up the Olympics. And I went over there cause Dave's one of my good friends and Wes is a friend. And what I said was, can I see all the hip extension in your programming? And they're like, we extend the hip every day. And they had zero hip extension in their program, except for a few jerks to one side. 
And so all we did was start to say, hey, let's make sure that there's actually hip extension. Even the war warming, the warm up lunges they were doing, the knee never went behind the butt. So uh, we had the same experience with Travis Mash, who had a ton of low back pain with his athletes. They started just programming in more sort of rear foot elevated split squats as a finisher, isometrics, throwing them in. And a lot of their back pain went out the window, like all of the back pain, because we were taking some of the extension load out of the spine, some of those forces that were cranking the pelvis over. And so just unloading the spine allowed us to have better jerk mechanics, better hip mechanics, and subsequently we get better glutes. So if I was going to keep an eye on all of the field sport athletes, we would be couch stretching every day and we'd be doing it, making sure we had glute activation. And I would be obsessing on making sure that my athletes were spending a lot of time in a tandem stance. And there's a lot of ways to train that. You can do heavy deads there. You can press there. You can do rear foot elevated split squats. At the very least, we would do lots and lots of heavy isometrics. So if my athletes got into a big tandem stance and, you know, we put that front foot, the back foot up on the toes and I gave you 200 pound kettlebells to hold on to, we had to do 30 second holds and make sure that you have access to that position. So I, I suspect insufficient hamstring loading eccentrically. And again, that's kettlebell swing solves all that problems for me. And then secondarily is, is making sure that people have access to their boot, butt when the hips an extension, but that's just me. What do I know? Kelly. Kelly. Oh, sorry. Right. Are you on that hamstring subject? No. Okay. okay. So on the, you know, the idea of restoring hip extension or getting back to a more, natural place or kind of baseline place a lot of times you'll see people say i did one session of the couch stretch or whatever it is and they'll train again a week later having done one session and their hip extension has gone back to where it was and they i suppose they don't treat it like i i, I squatted a month ago yeah, yeah i don't get it and people are like oh i you don't squat max your squat and then don't train for a month and then come back and squat and wonder why you're weaker you understand that but a lot of people don't seem to understand that mobility is a skill or range of motion is, is something you have to keep practicing. But of course, like strength training, aerobic capacity, there's like a baseline that comes up over the years. Is there any, is it massively individual changes or do you feel like there's kind of, you know, if everyone's hitting this for six months, we're going to see a good baseline change. Is there a time frame? Oh, one month. I mean, you know, you start, you start noodling on it, you know, and again, this is this practice idea, greasing the groove practice. You know, some of it is telling your brain, you know, this is a position we value, but the real thing is why are you having to work on it so much? What is it about your programming lifestyle that you never put your knee behind your butt? And we, you know, that's what we see is we see like, wow, you're doing a lot of squatting and a lot of squatting activities, a lot of sitting and very little training of your hip and extension besides the warm ups you did. So what we start to see is this real asymmetry between work volume and actual exposure volume. You know, and again, if you're couch stretching and you get a knee pain, that can happen in a single session, right? Couch stretching because your low back hurts. But these long-term changes in tissues, we have to remodel the tissues and we have to signal to your brain to be safe there. So, um, you know, if there's one thing I would have everyone do for the rest of their life would be some iteration of couch stretch. And by the way, the couch stretch is sort of like the mid-level the real couch stretch is your front foot is elevated, you know, 12 to 20 inches. That's the real couch stretch. And that's a hip lock. Oh, we're just back into a different kind of hip lock. You know, that's that's why uh, we do those things. Kelly, I was just over at the Rugby World Cup this weekend and talking to lots of ex-players, lots of coaches, people I meet over the years. And the number one question I got was recovery. How do we recover better? What's the story? My whoop strap is telling me something different. <laughs> I've got the lads in ice baths after Monday sessions. What yeah. should I be doing? And to be honest, it's just, it's a shit show at the moment. Everyone's doing everything. Everyone thinks it's going to have some, some magical outcome for them. What are your go-to recovery things for athletes after their strength and conditioning work or after their sports specific yeah. work? I'll give you three things that I think uh, I want four things, four things. Number one is I need you to walk more. And, and the walking is just decongestion. I just want to decongest the tissues. However you want to do that's up to you. You want to get up in the pool and mess around for 30 minutes. You want to go for a walk. You want to ride the bike. I don't care. Just unloaded, dumb, non-exercise activity. And I just need you to continue to, to pump the lymphatics, right? So that's, that's why we're doing, we're big on walking. And we have a lot of our pro athletes walk before, walk after, and it's just easy. Go out with your family, get up some sunshine, you know, you can do no, you can do all the breathing drills and all the eye drills you want while you're doing that stuff. But what we find is that if I redline and then or I'm in, inactive, then I'm going to have backup and I'm going to be congested. And the lymphatic system is 
the sewage system of the body. So we're really trying to turn over broken tissues and all those proteins. Those all come out through the lymphatic system. My knee is swollen after a match. It's all like the knee is drained by the deep lymphatic. So if I, I either muscle contracting or not. So now we can start to say, well, what other ways I can do that? Well, I can maybe be able to squeeze, jump in the boots for an hour. That helps. I might be able to put on something like a Mark Pro and, and decongest through NMES, right? Movement without motion, that can be useful. Number two is that I really do hammer on nutrition. I am like, hey, I need to see that you're getting a gram of protein per pound body weight. And I need to eat, eat way more fruits and vegetables. You're not getting enough fiber and micronutrients. So I want to see that you're getting 800 grams of fruits and vegetables every day. And, and that can all be in berries. That can all be in melon. That can be in apples. I know you don't like vegetables and you think that vegetables are poisoning you. You don't have to eat vegetables, you know, but I need to see that you're getting more micronutrients and fiber. And if you look at some of the best athlete programs, they're putting all of that into the athlete, right? And what we, if I dropped in and looked at your athletes for the day, I would see zero fruits and vegetables. I'd see one, you know, maybe one piece of fruit, one banana. So I'm like highly deficient in fiber, highly deficient in micronutrients. I need to see eight plus hours of sleep. And ideally you're in bed for nine hours to get eight hours. So all the magical adaptation happens at eight hours of sleep. And seven is our minimum threshold. And if you got a big match the night before, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. You're a human being, you're an athlete. But if you're going to recover and adapt and grow, that's got to be over eight. And usually it's nine plus a nap. And so suddenly between the walking, the nutrition, the sleep, we're seeing that athletes are missing one or all of those things. And then the next thing I'd put in there is I want you to do some soft tissue work before you go to bed. I want you to ask yourself what's tight. If you want to have a massage therapist do it too, that's cool. But I can't afford that. But I can get on my floor in the evening for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes and roll out something that feels tight. What feels stiff? What feels sore? What positions do I want to work on? Do some breathing. And suddenly, if you just engage in those things, what we'll find is whoever has the best genetics now is going to win. And we're starting to pick it up. We can find out if you don't have excellent heart rate variability, chances are you'll never be an international level football player. If you don't, like we, we're starting to make these connections now on the data that some people can just hot, handle higher and higher workloads. Not everyone got the best parents. And so genetics definitely come into it. But suddenly, if we can start to just normalize in some of those other things, we do start to see that people can handle higher loads. And really what we're talking about is not recovery, but minimizing session costs, which is actually a, um, a Ben Ashworth term. And he was a first team physio at Arsenal. And session cost is everything we do physically has a, has a cost on the CNS, has a cost on the body. And really what we're trying to do is not deny that, but reduce that cost so that we can handle higher work tolerances, what work loads over, over time. You know, I work with this uh, women's water polo team at Cal. They don't outwork Stanford. Stanford does not work USC. Like that, that's a line of bullshit that needs to end. People cannot outwork each other. What you can do is reduce the session cost massively of the work you've done and actually handle more and more volume over time. And that's how we see the differences emerge. So those are always my first things first. On the subject of recovery and those elite athletes, and obviously don't have to specify anyone here, but as we know, elite athletes are no strangers to PEDs or any related substances. Is there anything from maybe a movement mechanics kind of point of view or your, you know, your kind of a professional side that you've seen is just wild when it comes to outcomes from PEDs in terms of you've never seen this problem before compared to someone who doesn't use PEDs, but who is also a high level athlete. Is there any like major differences that you kind of consistently see crop up between the two? Um, there's a reason that a lot of the bodybuilding goes along with some of the strength training because we need to put those tendons in connective tissue and give them a chance to catch up with the, with the ramped up machinery. So it's easy when you start to see weird fascial strains and tendon, tendinopathies and things, and kids are really big and strong and they're in sports where that they're incentivized to use peds, then that's something we just have to keep an eye on just because that you can get so big and strong and the body doesn't catch up. It's the same thing that happens. So everyone knows to all my teenagers I work with, the teenagers are on massive amounts of steroids. They just have to be self-made <laughs> their, their bones grow like weeds and their connective tissue lags behind. And they have all these Osgood slaughter, all these tendinopathies They're, they get become muscle bound because their muscles are so tight because they haven't grown to, to lengthen out the tensions. So they're not tight as in like, I'm tight. 
I have pain. They're tight as in like, I just grew three inches and I have to grow three more inches of hamstrings. Yeah. So well, I think we can lean, lean into that model and say, Hey, that's probably what's going on there. You know, I, I did hear from some world-class coaches recently um, that in the eighties, the greatest stack of all time was steroids and cocaine. Just so we're clear. I just want to know want everyone to know how high the bar is steroids and cocaine is actually the greatest training stack of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dara's just a fan of the cocaine. You're missing the steroids. Is the problem there? <laughs> the '80s, man. The '80s, yeah. were, and, the, and these were these are world class coaches that were like, yeah, it was wild and powerlifting. We're seeing just this crazy, crazy output. There, there's a few world records, Kelly, that um, we've heard are set with cocaine as one of the pre workouts. Mm. Um, we won't say which, but you can guess. Oh man! Yeah. we could tell man, you after. Yeah. We can tell you after. We'll tell you after the. Is it Thanks. is it smelling salts? Is it is it really smelling salts? Oh, it's not <laughs> smelling salts. <laughs> well, you know, this is what I'll say is, um, you know, I've been in around a lot of sports where people are incentivized to use pets. It's not my expertise, but we, there were people people in my gym in the past who are in sports that allowed that or whatever. And I have athletes who are being tested by USADA and they're not allowed to like shake hands. I'm like, you guys can't, you know, can't touch. You can't like, you know, let's be cool here. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is, and I'll just repeat this over and over again, because I think PEDS and SARMs are everywhere. Um, I never saw any of that stuff make a good athlete great. I saw it make great athletes great. -er. Yeah. And what I mean great -er is that they can handle freakishly high levels of work. And I'm not talking about bodybuilding. I really just think the, the aesthetics and bodybuilding aside, what really when we're, we're talking about is, can you work harder? And now we have a set of tools in place that is, we, we're between the nutrition, some of the other things, you really have to make the case for it. it. It is really hard to talk about that because, you know, a lot of times the online discourse in a lot of places currently is, yeah, but it's gear, you know, you're like, look, the gear pads are definitely helping this at least, but he or she is still a million times better than you would ever be. Not only the fact that, They've set up their life to be a professional athlete. Not only the fact that they are using PEDS, which again, without a doubt, and we always talk about it, that it does help. But they were just born to be a better athlete than you. There's nothing you could do to catch up to them. No amount of PEDS would do that, you know. And it's kind of, and it is a, it's such a hard balance to strike because, yeah, the PEDS do work, but they're still better than you, you know. And it's, and it's not even a, a subjective kind of insult to that person. No. It's objectively, they are just made of different stuff, you know, and it is a, it's a funny balance to strike without insulting people. CrossFit is probably at risk of, of having people believe that if they eat a certain way and train a certain modality, they could be elite. And I'm like, no, you, you know, there's been enough times where I've been standing around parents, you know, and they're like, my child is, and I was like, have you ever seen the unicorn? And they're like, no, like they're like a real unicorn. I'm like, yeah, have you seen a real unicorn? And they're like, no. And I'm like, but if you saw a real unicorn, you would know what it is right away. And then we'll go to a tournament and there's a unicorn there, one unicorn and 2000 kids. I'm like, anyone spot the unicorn? And people were like, oh, is that what you mean? I'm like, yeah, that kid may <laughs> yeah. get a division one scholarship. May, right? You know, um, I think it's one of the things that I, I just watched the David Beckham documentary, which is so good and you're like wow he's been great forever he was a little tiny little bloke on the field and he was great and that leads me to thinking how early did he start taking steroids to be that good at soccer when he was five years old when he was three years old in the backyard i can only imagine cocaine i'd imagine at that age <laughs> yeah oh yeah. man so um you know i usain bolt said it best he's like if you were great you were always great and i think what we can often do is look back and say show me how long you've been great or and what you'll see is there's a repeated pattern of greatness forever and i think that that's that that's what's really remarkable and i'm like i'm sorry if you didn't w wake up great and, you know uh, you know not gonna be great at the moment i'm i'm trying to squat a, a pretty big weight high bar you know and um a lot of times at the moment I'm squatting like five times a week and I'm changing between shoes just because it's novel, you know, and I'm doing jujitsu and yeah. squatting and conditioning and people are like, why are you wearing those shoes? And they're like, oh, why did you do that? Said barefoot. And I'm like, look, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it's the first time I squatted a 17, I could squat 120 for reps, high bar, you know, and it's just, we've coached thousands yeah. of people and it's sat 
And I, I, I do like to say it a lot because it's like, don't like forget about what I'm doing. Listen to what we're saying when we talk about squatting, but don't um, don't wear one shoe and not another shoe or something just because you saw me doing it. Like, forget about it. You know, it's a waste of your time. And it's only it's disheartening, if anything, you know, because yeah. I could wear the same clothes as LeBron, but I definitely cannot dunk at five nine. You know, it's, not, <laughs> it's, it's you pick your lane, essentially. I think that's you one of the your, things you found your sport. Of, yeah. Yeah. It, and it's not dunking basketballs. <laughs> But I think that's one of the, the things that having a very talented young athlete in a CrossFit gym is so useful for that CrossFit coach because th- it's the ultimate arbiter of reason of just like, oh, you want to go to the games? It's like, she's 15 and she jerks more weight than you. You're not <laughs> going to go to the games. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. so true. stop spending it's 400 euro a week on CrossFit gear. Just no. be happy with your training. <laughs> I know. Look, I... I just want everyone to know that like one of my goals is just to be less gross for my wife. Less gross. <laughs> Not look good naked, just less gross. And then yeah. I can start to ask, like, what, what does that look like? And I will tell you, on the other side of 50, you know, um, my training looks different. I don't need to handle – I mean, I, I just – it looks different. I can't put enough energy into my aerobic system these days. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter what I do with my diet. I'm like, I'm this old man's strength. Turns out deadlifting heavy for 20 years makes you thick in the middle. Who knew that? I didn't know that. And then my friends were like, oh, yeah, that's why some of the bodybuilders don't deadlift because it gets them too thick. I'm like, noted. And, um, <laughs> you know, you know, the real goal is what's your goal? What is, what is it you want to do? And I think when we ask that question, then we can kind of work backwards and, and make sense of what's going on. What is it you want to do with your body? And if you don't want to do much with your body, you can get what you can do. You can probably train however you want to train. And I think that really is the the decision tree matrix where I'm like, hey, I, I appreciate where you're coming from on the internet. But, you know, I someone, one of my friends was like, hey, do you follow this guy? And I was like, oh, he has 2 million followers. And I was like, oh, it's just bodybuilding. That's super cool. That guy has nothing to say about all of these other sports and skills. But, man, he looks good with his shirt off. And, you know, he has 2 million followers. And if you want to be a bodybuilder and look like that, cool. You can do that, but that has nothing to do with winning a world championship or, or going faster and you know any of the sports we're talking about. I think it's time for it's surely time for TRT Kelly. Surely at fifty, it's you know you can ramp up your training again, get it rolling. Oh man, sign me up! Look, <laughs> I, look, I, I am you know I, I protect my sleep like it's my job. I can't eat like a spoiled teenager. You know, I really do pay attention. I get blood panels all the time. I'm looking all those things. And, and, you know, I want people to hear that, you know, the real, the real shame with the access to TRT, and I don't have any problem with anyone doing it, like libido high, keeping muscle mass. If, if muscle mass is the golden key, let's, let's ask this, but you cannot drink a bottle of wine tonight and do that. You can't not sleep and do that. You can't, you can't fake it. So, you know, really there's so much low hanging fruit. I mean, people get some sunlight and vitamin D and their testosterone is up 200. I'm like, really? So you were going to take testosterone, but you could have just had some vitamin D and some sunlight, you know, you could have slept a little more. I think that that's where it's gotten a little confusing. And I, one of my good friends is a guy named Alan Lim, who was the director of sports performance in Tour de France for a long time. His company is scratch uh, the, all the, you know, the drink mixes and things, but he just says, you cannot cheat your physiology full stop. And I think when you, go into anything and ask that question, you know, and, and you get that response, you should keep that in mind. You cannot cheat your human biology. Yeah. One of the real common uh, questions or line of questioning we'll get around sleep and around recovery is I do shift work or I look mm-hmm. after my kids oh. for half the day and then I go to That's work right. and, and they're always looking for that cheat of like, Oh, you just have to, do salutations to the sun when you wake up or whatever it's going to be like there really is no easy way around it so no. a lot of, a lot of the time you just have you can't, to you can't you can't be the best in the world that's what yeah. i'll say but you can be really great and you can be look great and you can have a body that you trust and you just have to really it means you might not be able to also tolerate drinking and a whole bunch of extra volume that these other kids can tolerate that's what it means but you know so what can't be helped must be made to bear and uh you know with that's the case we, we've done the research and shift work kills people so how are we going to protect you? And what's our first order of business to keep you surviving shift work? Not any other thing. Yeah. Stop doing shift work is the first answer. Usually is get a new job. It's and, actually... we, and that's right. And if we can't do that, then we say, okay, well, what are we going to control? And then we're going to lean into your physiology. I mean, that 100%. What I'm going to say, though, is you can't smash yourself doing high-intensity exercise. 
Unless you're on TRT. <laughs> Come on. You can burn the candle at both sides. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Now you're getting to Kelly. Kelly, thank you so much. Wait, honestly, it's a very amazing how this goes, you know? Yeah. Watching videos 10 years ago and, uh, you know, sitting there on a Monday night doing a podcast with you is a very cool experience. And uh, you're as charming as you come across on your YouTube. Oh, uh, it is a total pleasure to talk strength and conditioning and nerdiness. And really, people, this is my, this is all I like. Welcome to this is it. I, I'll, uh, how many more hours we got? Eight more hours, nine more hours. You guys are going to blink and have to pee before I do. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I hope we can, uh, hope we can do this again. And, um, uh, it is total pleasure. And let me just reiterate everyone the strength coach is the most important person in society right now. That's why it's seek a strength. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, no, thanks, Kelly so much. thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah. We're we're massively appreciative. Yeah.